Today everyone, in this video we are going to talk about the sampling techniques in quantitative research, particularly the probability sampling methods. But first, let's identify the differences between population and sample. Population refers to a larger pool of potential participants in a research study, whereas sample refers to the participants obtained from the larger population. The sample is used to represent the larger population. Now you might be wondering, why is there a need to have a representative sample in research? Sampling is done because we usually cannot gather data from the entire population. If we try to gather data from the entire population, it's going to be taxing, impractical, and very much time-consuming. Having a representative sample is much more practical because not only does it help save time for data gathering because of the less number of participants, if done properly, it allows for accurate generalization of whatever research findings we may have. Now with this in mind, the next question is how do I calculate or determine the sample size for my research? There are many factors that should be considered when determining the sample size. First. We have the budget for a large or a small sample. Second, the research design used. The confidence level. The characteristics of the target sample. And the sampling method that is used. One way to calculate the sample is by using Slovin's formula. Where n equals the total population, the smaller n would represent the sample, and e is the margin of error. Take note that the margin of error is dependent on the confidence level that we will be using. Let's have this for example. A total population of 1,500 individuals and our confidence level would be 95% which would be the standard. However, take note that the confidence level could depend on the researcher. It could go higher such as 98, 99% or even lower than 95%. But the standard level is at 95%. With this in mind, our margin of error would then be 0.05. Let's apply the formula. We have 1,500 over 1 plus 1,500 times 0 0.05 squared. From this particular equation, we're able to have the answer of 315.78. Now, since we cannot consider decimals in our population, we then round it off. From this particular solution, we're able to come up with the answer of 316. Thus, for a population of 1,500 individuals, the appropriate representative sample for a 95% confidence level would be 316 individuals. Another way of calculating for the sample would be this formula for calculating for simple random sampling. The formula is z score squared times standard deviation multiplied by 1 minus standard deviation over margin of error squared. Remember that the z-score depends on the confidence level. For 90% confidence level, we have 1.645, 95% would have 1.96, and 99% would have 2.576. For the margin of error, we have 0 0.010 for 90%, 0 0.05 for 95%, and 0.001 for 99%. In terms of the standard deviation, the standard would be 0.5. Let's apply this formula. Remember that we are after the standard, which would be 95%. So we're going to have 95% for our confidence level. Thus, we're going to have the C-score of 1.96. For the margin of error, we're going to have 0.05. And for the standard deviation, we're going to use 0.5. From this, we're going to apply the formula. Thus, we have 1.96 squared multiplied by 0.5 times 1 minus 0.5 over margin of error, which is 0.05 squared. From here, we have 0.9604 over 0.0025. From this particular equation, we're able to have the answer of 384.16 since we do not recognize decimals in sampling we round it off thus our final answer would be 384 individuals in order for us to have an accurate sample for random sampling
Now at this point, we're going to talk about the different sampling techniques. Remember that there are two ways on how we could get a sample. First, we have the probability sampling and non-probability sampling. In probability sampling, each member of the population has equal chances of being selected as a participant in the study. In other words, the selection is done randomly. In non-probability sampling, it involves purposely choosing participants according to some identified variables. In non-probability sampling, no random selection is done. Now at this point, we're going to talk about the different probability sampling techniques, starting with simple random sampling. Simple random sampling allows for each member of the population to have equal chances of being selected as member of the sample. It usually involves two simple steps. First is to assign numbers to the members of the population. Next is to randomly select or draw a number from the list. Since this is random selection, there is no sequence or there is no pattern as to who would be selected first or who would be selected next. It pretty much is randomly selected based on whichever is going to be drawn from the list. Whoever is selected will become part of the representative sample for the study. Next, we have stratified random sampling. Stratified random sampling involves dividing the population into homogeneous subgroups. This is to ensure equal representation of each subgroup. It usually involves two steps. First is to divide the population into different subgroups or strata. For example, we have a study that aims to determine the feedbacks of senior high school students about the benefits of online learning. For this particular context, our strata or subgroups would be the different strands or tracks that the students are taking. Thus, we have ABM, STEM, Humes, TechVoc, and AD. The reason why we have these particular strata is because each particular strand would have different numbers of students enrolled in them. Next, after we have divided the population into different subgroups or strata, we then randomly select the members of the sample for each subgroup. Say for example, we need a total population of 25 for our sample size. We then identify 5 members from each of the subgroup in order to have equal representation from each strata. Next, we have systematic random sampling. Systematic random sampling is conducted when simple random sampling or stratified random sampling proves to be too tedious or complicated due to large populations. It usually involves four steps. First is to number the units from 1 to n, where n equals the total population. Next is to compute for the sample size. After that, we compute for the interval size, which is k, where k equals the total population divided by the sample size that has been computed. Next, we then take every kth unit as a member of the representative sample. Let's have this example of 1,500 people for our population. From a total population of 1,500 individuals, we then compute for the sample size using Slobin's formula. We now have 316. From this, we now compute for the interval size. Thus, we have 1,500 divided by 316. From this particular equation, we're able to have the answer of 4.74. Since we cannot have decimal points or decimals in our sampling, we round it off. Thus, we have 5. As such, every fifth unit will then be selected as a sample. We now apply this in our list. We now take every fifth person in our list to become part of our sample. And lastly, we have cluster sampling. Cluster sampling is used when the members of the population are dispensed across a wide geographic location. It usually involves randomly selecting districts from a target area to become part of the sample. It involves different steps. First is to divide the population into clusters based on geographic boundaries. Next is to randomly select clusters. 
and lastly is to randomly select units from each selected cluster. For example, we have this study that aims to identify the common learning styles of students in the city of P with a total population of 600,000 students. First, we identify the different clusters based on geographic boundaries. This could be the different districts or barangays in this particular city. From there, we randomly select the clusters that will be involved in the study. Again, since this is randomly selected, Everyone or every cluster has equal chances to become selected to become part of the study. After that, we randomly select units from each selected cluster to represent the entire population. Now, when identifying the clusters, ideally it must meet the following criteria. First, each cluster's population should be as diverse as possible meaning every potential characteristic of the entire population to be represented in each cluster is there. Next, each cluster should have a similar distribution of characteristics as the distribution of the population as a whole. And lastly, there should not be any overlap between clusters, meaning each particular member of each cluster is exclusive in that specific cluster. In a nutshell, Quantitative research relies on the involvement of a large number of participants for proper representation and generalization of findings. Sampling is a necessary step in identifying the accurate number of participants in a quantitative research for a proper generalization. There are different probability sampling methods that may be used by the researcher depending on his research design. And each of these sampling methods follow certain steps that help the researcher be able to effectively acquire the needed sample for research.